Fred Burton was 15 years old when his neighbor, Joe Alon, was murdered in cold blood. The assassin was never caught, and the case was closed. Though he didn't know it at the time, the incident would echo throughout his life, both as an investigator and as an author. After beginning his career as a Maryland police officer, Fred became a special agent with the Diplomatic Security Service, becoming chief of the DSS's counterterrorism division. He was intimately involved in the investigation and arrest of Ramzi Youssef, the mastermind behind the first World Trade Center bombing, and the pursuit of Abu Nadal and several other high-profile terrorists and assassins. Many of these were detailed in his book, Ghost, Confessions of a Counterterrorism Agent. His life came full circle when he reopened the investigation into Joe Alon's murder, which he chronicled in Chasing Shadows. His most recent book, Beirut Rules, tells the harrowing story of the abduction of a CIA station chief, William Buckley, by Hezbollah, and the frantic search that ended with his torture and murder, and ignited a war with extremism that continues today. As long as there are threats to the United States, you can bet Fred Burton will be thinking about how to stop them and sharing that knowledge in his brilliant writings. I'm Fred Burton, the author of Beirut Rules, and all of you should be watching The Crew Reviews. Hey, boys, let's raise a glass. We have Fred Burton in the house. Ah, love it. Welcome, Fred. How are you, Fred? Thank you guys for having me on. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for coming on, Fred. So, Fred, your, your latest book, Beirut Rules, right over my right shoulder, it, uh, it involves or revolves around the kidnapping and murder of William Buckley. Can you tell us who William Buckley was and why you thought this story needed to be told now? Chris, uh, this case kind of haunted me for a long time. And I had actually worked on uh, the kidnapping of the only CIA station chief uh, back in the day when I was a special agent at the State Department and I was assigned to the CIA's hostage location task force. And after Bill Buckley was abducted in 1984, Uh, we put together a small interagency team to basically hunt for Bill. And our thought process was that if we found Bill Buckley, we would find all the other American hostages had been kidnapped with him. So uh, when I started thinking about a book uh, after uh, my Benghazi book, uh, I said this would be a great story to be told because Bill was one of those heroes in my eyes who had fought in two wars beginning in Korea. uh, And then he was a Green Beret in Vietnam and he joined the CIA. And he was always at, he was always the kind of guy that was running towards danger. So uh, after the first embassy bombing in Beirut in 1983, Bill was assigned and volunteered to go to Beirut, Lebanon to stand up the CIA's uh, intelligence operations there, which was a daunting task. Right. So uh, that's the backstory on Bill Buckley. Real, real quick, Fred, what, did he go? Did he go to uh, Beirut, kind of knowing that shit was going to go bad? You know, Chris, Chris, Bill. Um, in the course of the research for the story, uh, Bill was the kind of guy that would raise his hand and, and, and take assignments, meaning uh, right out of high school, he volunteers to go to Korea. So there was a persistent theme in Bill's career. And uh, he actually was a Silver Star recipient in Korea, in mm-hmm. Korea for rushing a uh, machine gun nest. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he volunteers to go to Vietnam. And then when he was with the agency, he volunteers to go to all these hot spots around the globe. So when Beirut literally tumbles and they're looking for someone to send, remember the CIA in those days are still very much stuck in a Cold War kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. We're battling the Russians. And so they have this asymmetric threat that's developing and they really did not know how to handle it. And so they looked at the paramilitary forces inside the CIA, and that's where Bill cut his teeth. 
And so Bill raises his hand and says, I'll go, send me. So uh, he volunteers to go uh, to stand up the intel operations at the time. So, Fred, you were intimately involved in that investigation, as we've discussed, and that's the crux of the book. But as you were, um, as you were doing your research, did you come across any or a lot of information that you were unaware of during that time? I, I was, um, Sean. I and and I'm sad to say this, but but you know, some of you guys know this. Uh, when you're in the government, you get an assignment you get a case, you really at times don't know as much about that person, victim, witness that you should. And I think that uh, I blame myself for that, for not making a concerted effort during that time period to know more about Bill. But I, I did not know that he had volunteered to go to Korea and, and had been awarded the Silver Star. Um, I did not know that uh, he was engaged heavily in uh, covert action inside of Vietnam uh, as part of the uh, Phoenix program. I did not know that he was working hand in glove with the Australian special forces during that time period. So there were things about Bill that I simply did not know. Quite frankly, I did not know that he had n never been married. Wow. And so uh, those are the kinds of things that I was not aware of. And, but when Bill was abducted, we literally did not have a lot of intelligence on the details surrounding his actual kidnapping either. So it was uh, um, in many ways, very eye-opening for me. Uh, you know, what, what I've enjoyed about doing books like this is getting to know the people that know the man. And so um, after uh, my Benghazi book came out, I approached the CIA and said, look, I would like to tell Bill's story. He's the 51st star on the Memorial Wall. He was a hero. And I, I think this is a story that should be told. Well, I emailed the CIA and literally that same day, I get an answer saying, we love the idea. How can we help? Now, how often does that happen when you email <laughs> anybody? In the incredible. Yeah. <laughs> that tells you how well regarded he was, though. Right. Yeah. yeah. And and so I had I was kind of shocked. And I said, well, can I come up and visit? And I did. And I met with the uh, head of their public relations department and then the uh, head of the uh, uh, the museum at the time. And, you know, Bill's case now is is a historical cold case. Right. So uh, they said, what would you like, Fred? And I said, I like his records declassified. I like some photos. I'd like for you to introduce me to some of the folks that Bill had worked with when he was at the station in Beirut. I had, I could find them, you know, but it would take me a fair amount of time to data mine those names and so forth. So the agency really helped, uh, which I'm extraordinarily grateful. Uh, I actually had, you, some of you may remember these, we had made uh, hostage bracelets during the, that time period right. for all the right. Americans that were kidnapped. So I had one for uh, Terry Anderson, who was the AP reporter, who at the time was the longest held hostage. And I mailed that to uh, Terry's daughter uh, in the course of putting together my book. And then I had one for Bill Buckley that I that was original, that was in pristine condition. And I, I asked the CIA if they would like that for their museum. Wow. And they said, sure, we would yeah. love to have it. We don't actually have one of the bracelets. So wow. huh. I donated that to the museum. You know, it's, it, it's certainly not worth a, a lot of money, but it's something for those of us who, who tried to find Bill um, meant a lot to us. And I felt that that would be the good place for it to be forever. Right. This might be tough to answer, but going back to the start of your answer, you, you talked about how you, you learned a lot about him. You didn't really know him before, before that or during the investigation. Can that, can that be advantageous though? Or I mean, I could, I could see where it could be an advantage and a disadvantage. If you, if you know the person really well that you're trying to find, you know, I could see emotion clouding it. On the other hand, I could also see emotion driving you. So what, what do you think? Do you think that that's a, an advantage to know them really well or, or a disadvantage or both? 
Well, I think it's a very good question. I think that uh, I probably should have done a better job at, at knowing uh, not only Bill, but all the other hostages. Uh, you know, for example, uh, one of the other hostages, Charlie Glass, uh, was an ABC correspondent when he was abducted in, in Lebanon. And he was the only hostage to actually escape. Mm -hmm. And he was very good friends with some of you may remember the uh, old TV news anchor, Peter Jennings. Yeah, sure. And so after Charlie was abducted, I sat down with Peter Jennings at the time and said, can you tell me more about Charlie? Give me a sense of what kind of guy he was. And with Bill, because he was a CIA official, uh, I think everybody kind of assumed that everybody knew you know, a lot about him already, but in reality, we, we really didn't. And so to answer your question, I wish I had known more things about Bill, the man that he had a pretty good sense of humor, uh, that, um, uh, you know, one thing that always troubled me, um, with Bill is I, I subsequently learned through the course of putting the book together that his greatest fear was being held hostage yeah. or being taken hostage. Right. And uh, I never knew that when I was hunting for him. Now, would that have changed the course of our direction? Not really. I mean, we, we basically had no human intelligence during that time period. Our uh, technical capabilities in that area were, were very shoddy. Uh, we were lucky to get, you know, rumor intelligence two weeks too late to, to do anything. But, you know, those kinds of nuggets, I think, um, would it have made a difference? You know, probably not. We never would have found him um, regardless, in, in my opinion, during that time period. Uh, so uh, maybe it would have drove me a little crazier than I probably already was when we were looking for the hostages. But, you know, knowing things like that on a personal level, to me, um, is, is always good to know. But having said that, maybe not in retrospect, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure the best way to answer that question. Yeah. Well, the, um, the one thing that one of the things, I mean, there were many things that stuck out to me when I read that book was that, that bill was, a you know, he was, that was one of his great fears of being kidnapped. Um, um, you know, like I said, there were among other things like his, his impressive career. Like I'm the guy was a been there, done there, done that type, type of individual. Do you think uh, as a CIA, CIA chief, kidnapped then could you think that happened today would it be easier no. or harder chris i i think that uh you know I, let me say this uh having done my book on benghazi and we all know yeah. what a mess right. that was having said that um uh, after bill was kidnapped and, and you know this from your government time uh the government does a good job at at fixing mistakes or looking at lessons learned and after Bill was abducted, uh, we all started going through uh, some of the modified SEER training. Uh, we all started going through hostage debriefing training as if you were potentially a, a hostage. Uh, we, made a good, we made a good effort at ensuring all of our personnel uh, were adequately protected. And the CIA did a wonderful job of post-Buckley abduction of creating the uh, teams that protect CIA officers in the field. Mm. So, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, it, it takes catastrophic events mm. in the government yeah. to force change. We all know that, you know, history is littered with them. Yeah. And, and Bill Buckley was just a casualty uh, of that. Unfortunate. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Fred, for those old enough to remember, I'm one of them. The, the time period around Beirut rules was kind of frightening to a lot of Americans. Um, uh, you know, up until that point, really, it was sort of kind of these gentlemen's rules of, of an agreement on behavior. You know, we didn't assassinate certain people. We didn't go after certain people. We, and then really Hezbollah really turned that on a complete dime. And, uh, you know, as we've already mentioned, um, our focus really was, you know, on the Russian bear and some of these larger you know, organizations, when you have like Hezbollah completely 
disrupted that um, and changed the, the face of, of what we know as, as terrorism. Where is Hezbollah now in the grand scheme of things when they kind of started this whole uh, phase? Well, Hezbollah today is probably uh, the most powerful, uh, legitimate political organization inside of Lebanon, which is somewhat frightening for an old, old uh, agent like me that has had to deal with their carnage uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, but I, I can tell you how blind we were to this threat, Mike. Uh, and, you know, you have to go back to uh, when the hostages were first taken and our embassies were first blown up in 83 and 84 in Beirut. We were also hitting Kuwait in 84. Mm. The, the group to claim credit was the Islamic Jihad Organization, the IJO. Right. And we suspected that it was Hezbollah, but we had no smoking gun. And we suspected that Iran was controlling Hezbollah, but we were still blind to that. We would spend hours inside our meetings, arguing amongst ourselves as to the, the, the degree of Iranian control over all of this. Mm -hmm. So we just lacked that um, intelligence to tell us that it was definitely Hezbollah. So uh, when you look at what Hezbollah did coming out of nowhere to attack at, at such a fevered pitch and also hijack airplanes, blow up embassies, take hostages uh, across the, the spectrum to include Russians and to do it so effectively. And we basically had no ability to, to stop any of their carnage throughout the Middle East from hijackings to hostage takings. Right. Fred, well, you spent uh, most of your law enforcement career as a special agent for the Diplomatic Security Service. For those who might not know, can you explain what the DSS is and what the duties of a DSS agent are? Sure. Uh, the DSS is uh, the State Department's law enforcement arm that's present in every embassy and consulate in the world today. And the organization actually goes back to 1916 when we had a chief special agent, and then they created the Office of Security inside the State Department that existed on up to 1984 and 1985 after the embassy bombings. And then Admiral Bobby Ray Inman uh, did the Inman panel study as to how did all these catastrophic events happen? We need to beef up the State Department security arm. So the diplomatic security service was created. Now, uh, the best way you could describe it internationally is they're kind of a sheriff at an embassy overseas, hmm. but they work alongside the Secret Service, the FBI, the, the DHS, that's also assigned in many embassies around the world. And then domestically, they do a tremendous amount of protection, for example, at the foreign minister level. Uh, and, and so historically, uh, the organization was one that would protect Yes, or Arafat of the PLO because he was not a recognized head of state mm -hmm. where the Secret Service would have him. And then we would historically protect like the British royals, like Princess Diana and her children and Prince Charles. And then anybody else that the Secretary of State so designates. So, you know, over the course of years, I look back on my career, I can remember we were protecting the likes of Salman Rushdie after Satanic Verses was written. Uh, many, many threatened foreign ministers in the United States that would come to visit or whatever. Uh, so uh, that's the, the DSS in a nutshell. One of the more fascinating jobs they have within the organization that, that many people are not aware of is they have the diplomatic courier service inside the organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're not the individuals that, that, that rot, run around the world with the handcuffed briefcase on their arm, as so many people suspect. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they do safeguard classified information. Uh, it's a great job to see the world. And then they're very heavy today into special event management, such as the Olympics that are around the world, right. and then security and engineering technology. So, you know, that's a field that I certainly am not smart enough to know how to deal with, but uh, uh, it, 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 it's a fascinating job, uh, especially if you want to see the world.
That is that yeah. is true. Just just a real side note. When I went through the um, Fletzy Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, um, half my class were Secret Service agents. The other half was DSS agents, and they usually paired us together because our missions are similar. Um, and then when I was in the New York City field office, I worked a bunch with DSS agents, became good friends with them because they would work, like you said, the foreign ministers, and we would work the head of state for um, you know visiting dignitaries or whatnot. Um, and then with Hillary Clinton, when she was sec Secretary of State, um, when she went overseas, she had DSS agents protect her. But when she was in town and she was in Westchester, she wanted the Secret Service agents to shuttle her around. So we always, and we were always working together hand in hand. I always found that DSS agents were um, of the caliber of Secret Service agents. Well, that's that's uh, good to hear, Chris. I, I'm I'm glad hard for him to that, say, that, I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm glad um, that you know. Typically, the Secret Service would want to put our cars so like at the end of the motorcades. I, I get that, uh, and then the FBI comes in and tells uh, everybody what to do uh, until we gang up on them and and kick yes. the FBI out of the uh, scene. I. I know exactly how that works. <laughs> if Don Bentley was here, uh, Fred, I would never, I would never say that about his, him or his. Agent. Oh, I would, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> Fred, you've been at this game for you know a number of years now, um, and when we look back a couple decades ago, right around um, you know, the, the the attack in New York City, two thousand and one, you really saw. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I think from a from a civilian standpoint, you really saw a, a global shift in terrorism and how it affects the global landscape versus you know a one off type of operation. Um, how forward are you guys looking? You or the people you work with are looking, and, and what do you see on the horizon that might pose a global shift in in a similar vein as like say nine eleven. Well, I think, uh, you know, the strategic strike by Al Qaeda on 9-11 on certainly changed the world. Uh, it, uh, you know, for those of us who were around in that, that game during that time period, it, I, I was not surprised. Uh, you know, they had certainly hit us in 93 in the first World Trade Center bombing, uh, which should have been a wake-up call, but it wasn't. Um, you know, from 93 to 2001, we were still very much dysfunctional from a counterterrorism perspective, uh, domestically and, and internationally, in my humbled opinion. Some may disagree, but I'd, I'd, I'd love to uh, talk more about that person that may disagree with me during that time period. But uh, as you look around the world today, I think uh, our efforts, uh, you know, thank goodness, uh, has have really done a great job of, um, of pretty much putting Al Qaeda uh, as we knew it out of business, uh, thanks to you know the Jack Cars of the world and yeah. our wonderful mm -hmm. special forces capabilities as as they've deployed around the globe. Uh, I, I look at you know the threats today to me. Uh, uh, you know the FBI, uh, in in fairness to the bureau, who who have done a wonderful job at at stopping. Uh, you know, other kinds of catastrophic attacks like we've recently saw with, you know, the plot against the governor in Michigan and Virginia right. that's just unfolding. Uh, you know, they've, they've done a good job at, at keeping our homeland safe. But I, but I also think it's been kind of an umbrella collective that we never have seen before, you know, with the creation of, you know, love them or hate them, TSA has, has prevented aircrafts from being hijacked and, and driven into buildings. You know, DHS has created the fusion centers and state and local law enforcement, you know, at least have a seat at the table at those. Yeah. So, um, you know, as I look around the world, I think there's much more dangerous places uh, today than inside the continental United States, uh, where, uh, as you look, the, the, they're, they just don't have that robust counterterrorism capacity that, that we have put together, you know, in our post 9-11 world. Right. Kind of staying with the same thing, Fred, in your, in your various law enforcement um, roles, you've acquired a ton of knowledge. Um, and some of it's not, it's best not for public consumption. So when you are writing these, these histories, your own personal histories, but also your histories within these investigations, how do you balance um, 
giving enough information that, you know, that it's an insider's view of the investigation without divulging too much or crossing certain lines? Well, um, I, I think uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the redactions, uh, the blackouts and Beirut rules, um, you know, I certainly have could have gone back and tried to appeal each and every one of them. But, you know, quite frankly, uh, as you put the book together, it's a labor of love. It took forever. The CIA took 11 months to clear that book. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, we, we kind of cried uncle once the book came back and the manuscript was, was done because uh, the publisher was getting tired of waiting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a business when you put together books. So uh, my co-author, Sam Katz, and I decided that it wasn't worth fighting uh, to try to go after the redactions uh, and that we would just publish the book and move on. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that those are the kinds of, of um, you know, if I had nothing else to do, I, I would have probably uh, tried to uh, go back at the agency and try to fight a couple of their, you know, redactions, which, you know, some of them, in my opinion, were silly. Uh, but hmm. let me wind back the clock to your, uh, that's a long-winded answer to your question. Uh, I remember Bob Baer, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, who, you know, has written several books about the agency. And, you know, he passed along some good advice many years ago. And he said, you know, just be careful. Don't write about sources and methods. Mm -hmm. It's okay to, to say that, you know, NSA does intercepts because everybody does that. Yeah. But don't identify specific people that you may have knowledge of or, or not have knowledge of. Um, so you just have to be careful along those lines. And I've gotten a little better with that. Now, in fairness to uh, Random House, when they published the book, I, I uh, thought the, the interesting part here is they could have made a decision just to delete the redactions completely. Mm. And then we would have done a little bit of editing, right? Yeah. They chose to keep the redactions in because they wanted full transparency on the part of the reader to know exactly what the government had taken out. Hmm. So, you know, that was an editorial call that, that they made that, you know, I, I'm okay with. Uh, so. I, I liked, I liked, um, I like when I read books and they have the blacked out <laughs> lines in it. Cause I'm just like, Oh, this shit's real. <laughs> it, it, it's a subliminal confirmation that you're real and you're reading yeah. the real stuff. Well, uh, you know, I've had others tell me that too. Uh, you know, I, I have to tell you, you know, if you go back, uh, you know, a lot of the redactions center on, I spoke to, for example, pretty much everybody that was in the station at the CIA base in Beirut when Bill was abducted, mm -hmm. except one person who didn't want to talk. And a lot of the old CIA warriors had not had their cover rolled back. So um, when I listed their names in my manuscript, they had not ever been formally hmm. declared as working for the agency. So a few of the redactions center around individuals such as that, yeah. you know, so I, and quite frankly, that was a mistake on my part. I should have asked them ahead of time, which I didn't, you know, Hey, you have any problems with, I did ask them, you have any problems with me sourcing you in the book? And none of them said, no, go ahead. <laughs> you know, some of them are, are getting kind of long in the tooth. And they basically said, you know, look, I don't give a damn. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm at the age now that, you know, who cares? Yeah. What are you going to do to me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> one of the things they blacked out, one of the things they blacked out was, was Bill's uh, gun. The mo make and model, which I was like, yeah, that what? there's uh, I, I think the backstory to that is that um, I think Bill was not carrying an authorized weapon. No. And mm. we all know how serious uh, the government takes that. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, you know, I can, I can remember investigating some of our people involved in, 
in shootings and terrorist attacks overseas where, let's say for the sake of argument, I'm not saying this actually happened, but let's say for the sake of argument that mm-hmm. some utilized a weapon that was not approved by headquarters, yeah. that uh, we always found a creative way to make sure that in the report uh, they were protected. <laughs> We just a little off topic. Uh, the Secret Service, we had a uh, approved list of backup weapons you can have, and I always thought it the interesting. There was a um, there was one weapon I won't I won't say which weapon it was, but it was only in it, I was like, why is this one in here? This is really strange, but it was only in there because a boss wanted to have that gun because he thought it was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> therefore it made the list. That's uh, well, there's your government for you, and uh, I, I don't. <laughs> I don't think disclosing, you know, what what pistol Bill had uh, in 1984 right. uh, is going to affect the national security of uh, the United States. But, no. uh, you know, so that would be the kind of issue that I could try to fight if I really wanted to. And uh, I would, you know, my my uh, disclosure lawyer is Mark Zaid mm-hmm. and Mark is all over social media with whistleblowers and all kinds of problems. He's a great guy, by the way, with a tremendous sense of humor for a lawyer. Uh, and, and Mark would have liked nothing better to, um, than to fight those kinds of issues. But, you know, after you get a book like that done, you're kind of exhausted. Yeah. And you really don't want to have to deal with uh, government bureaucracy. So yeah, I, I kind of gave up. Get that. <laughs> Understood. Uh, Speaking of the, of the books, you, you know, you co-wrote your last two books, Beirut Rules and Under Fire, the untold story of the attack on Benghazi with with Sam Katz. Like you were mentioned, you mentioned it before. Can you talk a little bit how you met Sam and what skills he brought to your writing ship, uh, your writing part? Absolutely. Sam, uh, there's a backstory to Sam, who is a great guy. And we're like polar op- opposites. He's he's a New Yorker. Mm-hmm. Um been writing about the NYPD for years, Israeli intelligence for years. Well, uh, I guess probably 20, 25 years ago, he wrote a book that's great. I have to give a plug if I can for his book called Relentless Pursuit. And in that book, he chronicled, uh, and I've gotten much, much more credit than I deserve for uh, the Ramsey Yosef capture, who was the mastermind of the first World Trade Center bombing. And uh, Sam wrote about DS, the Diplomatic Security Service, in his book. And he wrote about me in that book. And so when Benghazi happened, we'd stayed in touch over the years and gone back and forth on various counterterrorism journals and worked together on certain projects. And, and Sam just happened to call me after Benghazi and he said, hey, Fred, I'm thinking about doing a book on Benghazi. And I said, well, Sam, I am, I, I was too. I said, why don't we co- collaborate together? And uh, he said, great. And what I found, Chris, is now doing two books with Sam is uh, that two heads are better than one and we can uh, cross pollinate our chapters together and you have to have thick skin, as we all know in this business. So if I write a paragraph and it sucks, Sam says, this sucks, Fred, you need, I'm going to change it. Mm-hmm. And um, I do the same for Sam. And so we kind of tag team each other with our manuscripts. And and we worked very well together on Benghazi. Uh, on, and so, um, and he had sources that I didn't have and vice versa. And, and same when we were doing the uh, our book on on Bill Buckley in Beirut rules, you know Sam had uh, some very good contacts uh, within the Israeli security services, and we were able to marshal that side of the fence to help us make sense of of the Israeli perspective, which was you know everywhere which, which was, in Beirut. That, that was fascinating in the, in, yeah. in the book, it, you know, because it's just not about uh, Bill specifically i mean you delve into a whole bunch of other issues but to also see what the israelis were doing all at the same time was was fast at least for me it was fascinating absolutely uh, to take a peek behind the, the curtain a little bit yeah and you know sam's uh sam's got those kinds of contacts i mean you know he 
he wrote a book uh, recently on uh, the the horrific event surrounding the um, uh, the Jordanian Air Force pilot that was oh, yeah. shot down and and literally burned alive. Burned. It's called mm-hmm. No Shadows in the Desert, and Sam has maintained a relationship with the King of Jordan for years, and so he was able to sit down with the king and talk about that. And so, you know, um, the, the takeaway, I think, especially for those out there that may watch this is, you know, for me, I find it a lot less stressful to have a partner. Uh, I find it um, a lot easier if you can work well with a partner to, to put a book together. Mm. And, you know, um, I would encourage anybody that's thinking along those lines to do that. And, and um, so our relationship works well and we're constantly, you know, looking at other ideas to, to try to tackle that, to shine a little light on something that maybe needs to have a light sh- shown on it. Yeah. Hey, I want to step back from the books for just a quick second here. Um, <clears throat> you know, you spent a career in intelligence and, and security. What, for the average American, what are maybe the top, let's say, just say the top three things that every American should consider when they, when they think about security for themselves and their families as, as, as a small, you know, little pot of people. Well, I think first, uh, Mike, uh, that, uh, don't rely on anybody else, meaning, uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, the police and fire and EMS in this country, are, are very responsive, you know, depending upon your response time in certain areas that you can have to wait a long time for the cops or the, mm-hmm. for an ambulance, but make sure that you can self-sustain, that you uh, know how to take care of yourself, that you know how to stop the bleed, for example, which is something that I've learned how to do. Uh, and I have a stop the bleed kit with me that I keep with me in my briefcase and I keep one in my truck. So, learn how to take care of yourself, learn how to stop the bleed. And I think it's important upon all of us to um, make sure that uh, we look out for each other. And I think that that's somewhat of a lost kind of um, uh, civic duty with all the, the nasty political rhetoric that we've seen over the past, you know, 10 years that, uh, you know, as Americans, we've, we've always come together to do great things and that uh, we should do a better job of, of trying to look out for each other all the time. And so those are the three key points that, that I think that um, are, are very important. You know, I preach that to, to my kids and I preach that to uh, anybody that asks me that question. Good. Somewhere in Utah right now, Jack Carr is raising a glass to to that answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jack's uh, Jack's a good man. God bless him, uh, yeah. and he's been a, a good friend and and certainly been very supportive of me over the years. And you know, I I can tell you that this community and you guys see it all the time. You interview authors all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, folks um, are very supportive of each other. Uh, we we all know that it's a tough business. Uh, we all try to help each other. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it should be. Uh, so I, I'm very proud to, to, to know so many different writers, both in the fiction world and in the nonfiction world. So um, I, I'm very blessed to, to have those kinds of relationships. I agree. Us too. Us too. Uh, we, we find it every week. It's just a tremendous community. So Fred, you, you, under your collective works, whether it's Ghost, Chasing Shadows, Under Fire, or Beirut, Beirut Rules, you detail a career that includes, we've talked about the Buckley um, killing, Ramsey Youssef, Benghazi, among other truly historic investigations. Um, I know you've kept the black journal of terrorists and bad actors. So who's in that book that we haven't heard about? Well, I think you have to stay tuned for my next book uh, because, uh, you know, what I've tried to do is um, leap back into some of the cases that I've worked before that uh, I know a little bit about that can, well, a fair amount and some that can give me a good baseline. At least I know where to go to hunt for information. So I I think you're going to see a couple more names uh, exploited 
with any luck within 18 months. Uh, so uh, stay tuned on that. Wait, wait, let's We're narrow this down. Out. What time frames are we talking about? What time frame? Uh, what are we talking about? Like, what time are we talking 2010 or prior? Uh, well, I think we're talking uh, 2022, 2020. Oh, no, I think Chris is talking about the. Oh, incidents. no, I mean, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm trying to, trying to gauge where you're going with your. Oh, story. no, you're, you're, so you're, so you're using your finely honed Secret Service skills to, to get me to make uh, don't have an those. excited utterance. I don't know about honed. Uh, yeah, I, I've dodged too many FBI inquests to, mm. to fall for that one, Chris. <laughs> well, uh, the CIA, it's a huge organization, Fred. It's not impervious to changing political whims uh, of D.C., um, clearly, obviously. Uh, are they, do you think, in a better position to accomplish their mission than, say, back in 2000? Oh, big time. I mean, I was telling someone not too long ago about if you look at the, the CIA Counterterrorism Center back when I was over there in the mid-'80s, uh, you, you literally could count everybody on two hands, maybe, maybe three hands at best, if you count support personnel. And, crazy. Uh, you know, it's, it's night and day, but it's also night and day from, a, from technology, from innovation, from quality of mind to resources. I mean, uh, you know, we all have seen extraordinary resources at extraordinary resources at times at, at certain events, whether it be an inauguration for the Secret Service, an Olympics for the State Department, DSS. But when you start looking at the resources that the CIA have at their disposal now on a range of different targets and topics, I, I literally think it's night and day. And it's and I and I I have to say, you know, again, you know, for all the the folks out there that, that, that think this would be kind of a bad place to work. You know, I think it was always one of the most um, uh, engaging, thought provoking, um, innovative organizations that I, had, I, had, I was fortunate to ever have worked with on, on a range of different cases. And um, they're capable of doing things that no other government agency can. And I think, especially for those who who want to, you know, get engaged in the analysis field, you know, they they are the place to go because they have the best schools for analysis. Uh, they've got the Sherman Kent Center, uh, just the capabilities that they have. So, uh, you know, the agency today um, would be a wonderful place to work, um, and I think that it would be a great place for. Uh, for anybody to go and serve their country uh, if they're interested in intelligence, counterterrorism, nuclear prolifer proliferation, or, or, you know, a range of different national security topics. Yeah. Uh, well, that, Fred, is the, uh, the completion of our traditional interview where, uh, we, you know, we ask some heavy, some heavy, deep thinking questions, but we're going to get, we're going to get a little bit lighter. Um, we're going to go into the lightning round where, both uh, where Mike, Sean, and I are going to ask you, we're each going to ask you three questions. Uh, we didn't put a lot of thought into it, and hopefully you will just uh, I'll put a lot of thought into your answers. But I'm going to go first. Fire away. Uh, after the Secret Service and obviously the DSS, which federal agency, law enforcement agency, is the next best? The next best? I would have to say uh, the ATF. And the reason I say that is because I think that they're one of the unheralded organizations with a long storied history of uh, breaking the back of motorcycle gangs, white hate organizations, and they are at the front lines of combating violence in our nation's cities today. And I think they're not doing a good job of messaging that to the American public. Hmm. Yeah, they need to hire some more former FBI agents. <laughs> yes, they, that's one thing the Bureau does well. They know press conferences for sure. <laughs> that is true. Uh, I actually had a couple of Secret Service buddies who went over to the, uh, the ATF, and they love that agency. They love working those cases. They love it. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, as, back in the day, they were known as the best undercover 
agent organization of any, in my opinion. I, granted, you'll have others that will cry foul on that, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, and plus the nature of the business they're dealing with. And I don't think they get a lot of media. And I don't know if that's purposeful, but uh, I know that they've got great stories that they could tell. That goes without saying. Um, so I had, uh, I have, I have a question here, but I think I'm going to change it, boys. Something popped into my head. We were talking a lot about the CIA and the special activities division is no longer sad. Um, and they change their names. Why, why did they change that name? Uh, probably because they did not like sad, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, the agency in their own uh, infinite wisdom probably got tired of reading about it in the, um, the Washington Post and New York Times and, yeah. and decided that they need a, uh, another name, maybe something a little bit cooler. Right, right. <laughs> So now they're sack. <laughs> All right. Maybe um, they're happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, works. Um, you work for DSS. It means you worked with a lot of secretary states. Who was the best to work for? Oh, my. You are putting me on the spot. I, <clears throat> I think that um, uh, James Baker was probably okay. um, one, he was a Texan. Uh, two, he was an OBS guy. Uh, three, he was a straight that. shooter. He was very close to 41. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, he was a very intriguing, engaging man. But I have to say this, I think um, Secretary of State George Schultz uh, deserves a lot of credit for um, helping create the Diplomatic Security Service after the Inman Commission came back with that panel and supported it. And so he was always a strong supporter of uh, our organization when we first started to, you know, get it off the ground. Nice. Great answers. All right. Which U.S. embassy has the best food? Oh, my. Because um, <laughs> that's an important question. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and agents think like that. And that's, that's why my... <laughs> Uh, you've you've got me uh, now um, <clears throat> mulling that over. Mm. Um, I would have to say that maybe the U.S. Embassy in Beirut had the best food back mm -hmm. in the day. Right. Uh, I, I love you know I just love the Lebanese food. I'm sure others would perhaps argue, hmm. uh, but um, I, I'm sure I'm missing. You know, those that were lucky enough to be inside assigned to places like Paris would certainly argue that, that, you know, that they have a good meal. You know, Brussels. This is breaking news. It's not Beirut rules. It's Beirut rules. <laughs> <laughs> Love Lebanese food. Now though. we know. Now we know what the, where the name came from. They're, they're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is going to go deep now. So what can you tell us about Project Treadstone and Matt Damon's involvement? Well, I'm really not at liberty to discuss that. Mm. Uh, but I, I will say this, that I have been to Area 51. <laughs> and uh, I, I can't disclose that either. But you just did. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I would encourage you to ask uh, Brad Thor and Scott Harvath that question. Maybe uh, they can answer that. I, I'm, not at liberty, I'm not at liberty to disclose that. Dang it. I always thought I always thought if I you know got to the president's detail, I could eat, you know listen in on the conversations that he was having about aliens. Never heard any conversation. <laughs> Did you ever hear any or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So what was the CIA's craziest invention for use by intelligence operatives in the field? Well, I think um, the coolest museum that's not open for the public is the CIA museum. And you can look at it online and they have a great book that you can order that shows you pictures of some of the cool gadgets and stuff that they have in there. And they've got some really cool looking little um, surveillance devices, which um, if memory serves me right about the size of a hummingbird. And I think, yeah. and, and how they, 
yeah. how they flew those, I don't know. But mm-hmm. um, I down here in Austin, Texas, where I live, I actually looked out my window the other day and I saw a hummingbird there. And I got very nervous thinking that perhaps the KGB <laughs> or the CIA was looking for me, but it happened. It looked to be a real hummingbird. Mm-hmm. That was actually the crew reviews remote camera. Yeah, you know? was- <laughs> <laughs> What's Fred going to wear guess? tomorrow? Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We got that approved. Their budget is <laughs> it's a black, black project. <laughs> okay. Well, you got the, you got the last three questions. This one, it's always hard to say the, the top or the, it's, it's easier to say a top, but I'm still going to throw you a, um, a tough one. Who is the smartest man or woman you met in your intelligence career? Oh, my. Um, I think um, from a national security policy perspective however, or just however in general? You wanna, however you want to classify it. I'm going to give you that, lever, that latitude. I think uh, one of the most brilliant minds uh, that – uh, I still am in touch with is Carmen Medina, uh, who was uh, a very senior CIA official who retired not too long ago. And Carmen uh, is um, a self-described rebel. Uh, mm-hmm. She ran the Sherman Kent Center for a while. She is one of those individuals that just thinks differently, meaning uh, she sees the world differently. So if you present a problem, Uh, You know, her famous uh, line, I think, after COVID hit was, you know, look, uh, worst case scenarios can happen Mm -hmm. or, you know, they should not be surprising that that these kinds of events do happen. So people like that just see the world differently. Uh, So Carmen is is one of those great thinkers that is still out there and. Uh, she would be a great guest to have. She's written a couple books and uh, uh, it's just a wonderful person that that's fought a lot of uh, battles inside the agency to get to where she was too. Oh, I bet. Fantastic. And we'll make a note of that. This is writing <laughs> um, down names right now. <laughs> what historical crime or attack would you have most wanted to work the investigation? Oh, darn. That's a very good question. Uh, I, I think that, um, from, from my perspective, uh, I very much would like to go back and look at um, the Kennedy assassination, mm-hmm. which I know is something that's near and dear heart, near and dear to, uh, to Chris, uh, simply because if you just look at that period of time and all the dysfunctional government agencies when that occurred and you know, a little known fact is, you know, the Texas Rangers and the Dallas Police Department did a lot of work on that case. And uh, I, if memory serves me right, it was not a federal violation to shoot the president at, at that time. Jeez. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the FBI really came into the case a little bit late. And I think that that kind of case had so many twists and turns, you know, with the allegations of Oswald, you know, from his time in Russia to walking into the Russian embassy to Mexico in Mexico City that uh, I would really love to have worked on that case. Yeah, that would have been a cool one to work. Okay, your last question. um, This is another tough one. What tool, either technological, psychological, strategic or tactical that we do not use would make the most dramatic positive impact in either investigations or geopolitics? Wow, what tool or piece of uh, technology? Or, yeah, or, or tactical approach, either one. Uh, I think that um, when you look at uh, basics such as Google Earth, and with me, with the arc of transition from back in the 80s, not having tools such as that, uh, that is available today for anybody to look for a house, to a ranch, to a street, to me is amazing. And, and as I look back over my life to just see that kind of technology shift. But again, you're, you're talking to somebody that began with three by five index cards and a typewriter. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> when I think of the technology shift to something like that, it, it's really something that's out of the George Jetson kind of time period. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, law enforcement's come a long way in the, in, in the tools that we use to um, to investigate crimes. Pretty amazing. But I want to raise a drink to uh, to Fred. Fred, thanks for your service to our country Absolutely. as a special agent with DSS. All that you and as a firefighter in Bethesda, Maryland. I mean, you, you've been you've done a lot for our country. Thank you, sir. Thank you for writing these books. Beirut rules. People go out and buy it. It's, it's amazing. It's a really good read. You'll learn a lot too, and you'll appreciate. All the things that um, our government employees do for our country that we just don't know about half the time. Right. Cheers, sir. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Your guys are very kind. Thanks. Um, yeah, we had an awesome, awesome guest on today, boys. We had Fred Burton, former diplomatic mm -hmm. security special agent. Uh, he wrote this fantastic book. It's right there. Beirut Rules with Sam Katz. Details the life of William Buckley, a CIA station chief in Beirut. Um, dude, I learned a ton. I don't know about you guys. Um, reading this book, I learned a ton. Listening to Fred, we were talking before. That could have been a four-hour show. That's Absolutely. how good it is. He's like, he is full of knowledge, full of stories, um, and his dedicated service to our country. Uh, Barna. Barna. Is, is, it's impressive. So I want to raise a glass. Fred Burton. Sir. Cheers to service. That's not true. That's not true. Show some skin there, pal. Come on. What are we doing? Come on. Yeah. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, he's got a t-shirt on. You're the boy wonder of the show. Is it cold in there? Mm. It, it is. <laughs> I mean, boy toy of the show. What? Don't do it like that's just the boy toy of the show. It's just weird. <laughs> um, this is the a show for Did Fred have... Burton. And this is Christopher. And he's Who? nervous. What? He's nervous. I hear a voice. He's hearing voices. God? Chris. God, God is me, Margaret. <laughs> More in the collection plate, please. Next week, we have the author of Hey, God, it's me, Margaret. <laughs>